Thanks very much, Stephen. Tēnā koutou katoa. Te pōrahi tuku iho tanga o Pukeariki. Ko Andrew Moffat taku ingoa. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm uh, Andrew Moffat, Heritage Manager at, uh, at Pukeariki uh, from Tropical Taranaki, uh, or in the heart of Tropical Taranaki it is. Uh, and we're here today, uh, myself and uh, the um, currently absent Millie, uh, to discuss a, uh, a little digitisation project that we've got, uh, got running uh, involving a uh, large collection of photographic uh, negatives, um, which we call the Swainson Woods Collection. Um, so what we want this, uh, this session to do uh, is to be a really useful, um, a useful uh, session for people in terms of sharing some of the trials and some of the triumphs of this project, which uh, we're starting to stack up quite a few of both, to be honest. So what we want to do is run through, uh, share, share a few of these, which will hopefully inform, um, inform the projects that you're working on uh, in different ways. And um, yeah, it was really interesting to see uh, you know, Cliff's talk just before in terms of the different ways that the, the cake can be sliced, I guess. So uh, yeah, we're dealing, dealing with a different kind of collection here, and, uh, but similar issues. So. Um, so we can uh, get underway. So firstly, uh, for those of, those of you who don't live and breathe the project like we do at uh, Pukiariki, uh, a little bit about the collection. Uh, the Swates and Woods uh, collection is a large collection of studio photography. The photographic where negatives is an important part to, of, the, uh, of the equation. Uh, created by the New Plymouth uh, Photographic Studios, uh, Bernard Woods, uh, sorry, Swainson Studios, and uh, Bernard Woods Studio. So Joseph Swainson there, uh, you can pick him out uh, on the left. He was he established Swainson Studios in 1923. Uh, Bernard Woods took over the uh, studio um, together with his dog uh, in the 1960s, and then his daughter uh, Jenny Woods um, assumed uh, assumed responsibility for the business in the 1980s. So what they did, they took photos. And uh, the resulting collection of, of this, these years and years of practice, a very successful practice, was a large collection of uh, studio photography. So we've got primarily studio photography. Uh, as someone <coughs> said before, um, you know, there's a lot of weddings, a lot of uh, school groups, a lot of um, sports teams, that sort of thing. But also you can see we've got the odd tractor in there. Uh, a bit of uh, industrial heritage and some beer kissing. Um, so a little bit about the project, uh, I guess there's different ways to deal with this. So I was really interested this morning to hear about how you know a digitization project can kill institutions, and I think that that is uh, you know a very um, real risk with something of this scale arrives on, on our doorstep. Uh, the collection arrived at very short notice in 2005. It was offered to us and uh, the um, donation was brokered. Uh, and what it effectively did, it came in from, a, uh, from some storage uh, where it was stored in, in effectively a garden shed um, and arrived on our, um, arrived on our doorstep. Um, it was a, a deal brokered by the New Plymouth genealogists uh, together with, with some of our staff. Um, and this is the state of uh, some of the negatives when they arrived. They're actually um, surprisingly in, in surprisingly good condition. And uh, yeah, a lot there. You can see they're sorted by, uh, you know, they've got some, some um, identification and are sorted. But uh, yeah, I guess skeletally, skeletally identified would be a good way of saying. Um, yeah, and I won't go into the details, but there were things we were discovering. Well, well let's just say we found maggots. <laughs> um, so this effectively doubled the size of, of Pukiariki's uh, pictorial collection. Um, you see I've highlighted massive challenge. Uh, that certainly was on a collection management front. Um, and so with the help of, of um, some outside advice and uh, with a lot of head scratching on our behalf, uh, we came up with a plan. Uh, you can see it there, the three phases, cleaning, rehousing and cataloguing the two portions and then moving on to uh, digitising the collection which I think uh, we are all enjoying and that is the phase we're in now. 
So another thing to mention, this is a, uh, you know, a, huge, a huge effort uh, in terms of resource uh, and the reason you know, that this hasn't killed, killed us or we haven't just got them sitting in the, in the same state that they were is a huge amount of external uh, funding that we've been able to secure uh, over the years. Um, Taranaki Electricity Trust, the TSB Community Trust uh, and lotteries were, were very important as well in the first um, phase of the project. Uh, and also, obviously, we're part of the New Plymouth District Council, and uh, the, the genealogists have been a huge help, as I said, and a lot of the support broken um, by the Pukeareki Trust. So, you know, we're talking in total um, about $1.2 million of external funding over the life of the project from 2005 through to the, uh, through to the digitization. Uh, and it's also been a tremendous team effort in other ways. Um, I might get into trouble with this slide, uh, bringing up a few unfettering photos. <laughs> um, but I wanted to get across some of the scope, and you'll see there's some white areas there with people who, who haven't made it in. Um, you know, I'm really, really aware of uh, you know, the support we've had from a number of institutions, um, you know, National Library, um, chief among them, uh, but you know, and individuals as well. So it's been a huge team effort with the technicians cleaning, rehousing and cataloguing the collection. It's easy when you say it like that, but that's been years of hard work in the making to get us where we are now. So where we are now, uh, here's a shot from, of our, from our collection store, and I couldn't, we couldn't quite fit in all the boxes, but you'll see we've got uh, SW11 up there and running right down to uh, SW271 uh, is the number of boxes, I'm told, which the collection <laughs> is stored in. So uh, yeah, quite an impressive um, array there, and a lot of work to do. So uh, of course these were, um, you know, the collection was there, but really until uh, they're digitised, um, a collection of studio photography is not much use to uh, to anyone. So that's where the digitisation comes in. So I'd like to uh, hand over to uh, our digitisation coordinator, uh, Millie Mitchell Engen. Uh, this has been a, a big project for us, so um, Millie's going to uh, talk you through the next step. Yeah. Oh, flash. <laughs> Which one do you push? Uh, this one. Okay, yeah. so I'm awesome. um, Kia ora, I'm Millie Mitroanian and I'm the coordinator for the Swainson Witch Digitisation Project. Um, I'm going to talk about running this project, um, the equipment and processes we use, what it's taken to get it off the ground, um, and just some of the few trials and triumphs we've encountered along the way. Um, I'd also like to take the time to shout out to the National Library. Um, without their support, we'd be a little bit lost. Um, but uh, rather than dropping in the deep end, I'm going to briefly explain our process before moving into the technical stuff. Uh, we're simply capturing an image um, of a negative on top of a light box using a camera. So then we're inverting that image in Photoshop. Um, but yeah, the scanning the negatives was investigated, but um, we thought camera capture was a much faster and more efficient way to do it in the long run, um, especially when 110,000 negatives enters the equation. Um, but straight into the nitty gritty, um, our light box is specifically designed for negative capture. The Canon camera we use has the capability of capturing raw files around 26 megabytes in size. Uh, we use a 50mm lens for larger negatives. Oops, sorry, just dropping your phone, Andrew. Um, and a 100mm lens for smaller negatives. Uh, the UV filters are on our lenses to prevent uh, damage from the massive amounts of light filtering in. And then we sandwich the negative in between um, the light box and a sheet of glass, which is specifically designed to eliminate Newton rings, which as you can see from the cat picture here, like where the arrows are, they're undesirable in a digitization project. Um, we work with dual monitors, one higher quality Dell and a Philips is our secondary. Um, in terms of software, we're using Camera Raw to capture the raw image files, um, Adobe Bridge as a general file management tool, and Adobe Photoshop for editing our raw files. Uh, we use Vernon a collection management program for our text and image records, and FileZilla for uploading our records to the web each day, might I add. Um, onto storage, IT had been involved from the outset of this project. Uh, so we have a dedicated six terabyte server hosted by the New Plymouth District Council solely for Pukiariki images. Um, I also asked about the server before I came here, and we use a storage area network 
which is just a large cabinet of discs, all interconnected and configured for non-stop operations. Um, this is at the council, which is then backed up in another location within the city. And this information is backed up again and taken off site by a third party and stored somewhere securely in the depths of Taranaki. <laughs> so we're feeling pretty confident about our um, digital storage situation. Um, but on to training this week's awards team. Training began with Mark Yeti coming up from the National Library uh, to train Ruth Harvey, Charlotte Stace and I. Um, as you can see, Ruth, Charlotte and I are hard at work. Um, during training, Mark ran us through all the different scenarios we might encounter over the course of this project. Basic things like making sure file names were correct, uh, files were the right size, working on banal things like file structures, even though they're very important. Um, we cemented the processes we use, uh, developed generic workspaces for Photoshop and quick actions. Um, we spent a couple of days running through the project, seeing what cropped up, and you know, even Andrew had to learn the basics. Uh, yeah, and then together we all trained the new Swains and Woods team members, um, who are Claire Richardson, otherwise known as Dr. QA, me, Vice Vernon, Amber Cooksley, Professor Processor, and Jacob Mataitoga, none other than Ken Captain Capture. <coughs> um, so I explained a little bit about camera capture before, but for a little refresh, we start by sandwiching a negative between the light box and a layer of glass. We use camera raw to capture the image files in raw format. Um, and then those files are then saved onto our server. Alright, so, technical bit. Um, from there we crop, straighten, uh, crop and straighten raw files and then process them as 16-bit TIFF files in Photoshop. Uh, we have actions set up, so it's only one click, you know, one button to convert the image um, into the right colour profile, flip it and invert it. Um, We'll then bring in the levels, making sure not to lose any detail by introducing true blacks or whites, adjusting the midtones, and sometimes using curves to enhance them. Uh, we've, after we've finished processing, um, we'll save them as an 8-bit TIFF. Yeah. Once we've done a batch, they're ready for another team member to peer review and check the quality of our work. We call this QA. Um, yeah. Yeah. As we're checking the image, we're checking that the edge is not compromised, the image is sharp, and we check for hair and dirt that may have been added during our processing. Uh, we check whites, blacks, midtones. This is all like, quite a meticulous <laughs> process, as you can imagine. Um, we check that all the whites and blacks are within an RGB range of 10 to 245. And another aspect of the QA is a general audit as we're going with our Vernon records, which were already pre-done in stage one and two, stage two. Yeah. Um, and so there's also the ability there to add extra detail about the images. Once they're digitised, we can start adding, you know, extra terms and tags so that they're searchable. Um, our final TIFFs end up being about 17 megabytes in size. A smaller JPEG is then linked to Vernon for our online records. And so it goes from this in Vernon to this by the end of the day. And then during our daily uploads, the record is up, um, updated online. Um, all of what I've said so far is the easy bit since starting this journey um, to digitise the 110,000 negatives. We've had our moments and been tested on numerous occasions. Um, so in the beginning we had a bit of an issue with dust. Cotton gloves were leaving small flyaway fibres on everything, so we switched to nitro gloves. We made a Tyvek dust cover, dubbed Casper the Dust Free Ghost for our camera copy stand and light box. And, um, oh, wait, sorry. and because the collection came to us from a garden shed, not all the negatives were, are in great condition, so there's always an issue of trying to determine if a mark on the image is a pre-existing imperfection or something we may have added. So we're all experts at the game here versus scratch. Um, we also now clean the lenses once a week because at one stage we captured thousands of images with a small halo piece of dust on the lens, which we then had to recapture, you know, learning, learning curves. Um, another issue we've had to tackle is the shaky suspended floor we work on, which um, when someone walks past our workstation, it just shakes a little bit. So we've managed to work through this by capturing at a faster shutter speed and it hasn't been an issue so far. 
Um, and Newton rings. Even though we use Newton ring glass, pre-existing fingerprints on the negatives can look like Newton rings and give us a fright, but it keeps us on our toes. Um, so we were asked during our job interview if we could deal with uh, repetition, and I'm really going to wave a flag here and say I did, I did underestimate how many babies and brides there were going to be <laughs> in, in a studio collection. And I, I can confirm that people did get married and have babies in the 40s and 50s. <laughs> um, one day we checked our raw capture folder only to discover we've been shooting in low-res JPEGs for about 700 images or so. They're about 200 kilobytes in size, so useless. Um, so there's nothing we could do apart from recapture them. Uh, raw backlog. So <coughs> on the topic of raws, we're still struggling to find a balance between our raw capture station working faster than our processing and QA. So we currently sit on between five and 10,000 raws up our sleeves at any one time, um, which can be a bit of an insurance policy or you know, it can lead to other problems like capturing them with a piece of dust on them for a while. Um, and consistency, and it's taken a while to produce a consistent style amongst the team and it's, you know, it's still something we're constantly working on. And another hurdle is colour processing. We've got issues of blue hues, image quality, reflections, and the list goes on. Because colour digitisation hasn't been done on a large scale yet, we have no model to base our processes on. Uh, so we're figuring it out as we go. <laughs> and another major curveball the team was thrown wasn't the failure of the server, because it was amazing, but um, it felt like it at the time. One morning we arrived during our first week and all the work we'd produced so far had disappeared into the ether somewhere. Um, it was, however, a simple problem and solution. IT just changed the way they backed up our server. But, you know, there was a few heart attacks that morning. Um, this, however, wasn't the end of our computer woes. One day our 600 gigabyte Swanks and Woods folder had disappeared in its entirety. Um, suspecting the worst that it had been deleted, we rang IT and they searched and they couldn't find it. And so they were able to restore our data, so everything was restored by the next morning. So if you think about that, like 600 gigabytes of data, more heart attacks. Um, so yeah, having an amazing server is worth it and has already paid its dividends. Um, but, you know, it looks like the issues um, and trials we've had might outweigh the triumphs, but those trials are small fry in comparison to the massively rewarding outcomes from digitizing the collection. Um, I mean, just look at the amazing image images we get to digitize. <laughs> uh, we're starting to connect to the collection in a place of, like a lot more than I thought we expected. Uh, we see things that make us laugh. Um, and you know, particular triumphs of ours include learning about people in the collection. Uh, for instance, this is Merv Luke, a cyclist from Timaru who won the Round the Mountain Race in 1946. And one woman rang me up to tell me her son had won the exact same cup um, in 1997, which she then took to the pub, filled with beer, and then sculled it. Um, hashtag Taranaki. <laughs> um, another triumph is just how quickly we're working, despite the trials we're having. Uh, we, we, really, we really have to keep that in mind as we're sort of challenged by the various trials of the project. Um, we're also working out quicker ways to do things. Even on Vernon, when we would have copied data using Alt-O, we now do XML imports and exports. And, you know, there's now potential to apply these methods across the collection in lots of other ways. And another major triumph is the day-to-day -day problem solving we're faced with and finding solutions for. Um, but I think above all, the biggest mahi is when someone from the public is able to connect to the collection because of the digitization work we're doing. Um, because that's what it's all really about. So um, yeah, I'll hand you back to Andrew. Yeah, so um, Millie's led into that very nicely that, uh, you know, we now are faced with the challenge and the ongoing challenge of what to do with this with this amazing resource that we are in the process of creating. Um, so you see the quote there from from uh, Jeffrey Batchin, um, You know, we couldn't agree more that you know we we need to do things with this collection. We can't sit on it. Uh, it's important that we um, you know whether we take a scattergun approach or not. I guess. 
Um, so so we, we are doing a number of things with the collection uh, digitally and otherwise. Uh, we're using the newspaper in terms of uh, Artifact of the Week um, and also a Can You Help Us column. So these are two different ways of connecting the, the collection with the community. We're getting great, the Can You Help Us is just asking for identifications on, uh, on a photograph each week in the, da in the Daily News and we get a huge response from that. So. Uh, normally the phone rings pretty hot on a Wednesday morning, isn't it, Millie? So, uh, and we get sometimes a lot more information uh, than we bargained, uh, bargained for, <laughs> which the, the team, you know, we, we treat each, each thing as a real gift and, and it actually lifts us, uh, you know, um, sometimes I guess the first call might lift us more than the, than the 50th, but, um, you know, nevertheless, that's all part of the, the process and we really value that engagement. Uh, we record uh, that, that um, information in Vernon and uh, update the record of course. Uh, you'll see there the Inglewood Dramatic Society uh, in full, uh, full flight there. Uh, that refers to our um, series of digital exhibitions we run around the, the Taranaki region. Um, this came out of the, from the, some sponsorship from the Taranaki Electricity Trust initially. Um, and it's, it's a series of rotating digital exhibitions where we feature a lot of locally relevant content from the collection and again we're getting identifications through that and uh, yeah, amazing, amazing community connections. Um, we're actually touring a, a, a part of the, um, of the Swainson uh, Woods exhibition uh, around the region as well. Uh, yeah, so that's part of it. Um, we, we do, like Swainson's themselves uh, at the Winter Show, we do hold exhibitions as well. Uh, we've had a, a very successful one, which those uh, you saw those cutouts were from, uh, which Millie was modelling so well before. Um, yeah, so we, we've had that been a great way with really uh, giving the community ownership. Um, I had the question raised before to me, like, well, is, it, is everyone really interested in, in just all those photos of weddings uh, and, and babies? And actually, uh, the answer that we've had so far is a really resounding yes. Uh, people take huge ownership in this collection, and uh, it's got to grow. Um, Jacob here looming a little menacingly behind the light box uh, is promoting our behind the scenes tours that we're running as well. Uh, we've had a demand for that and uh, yeah we've been well subscribed so showing people what's actually involved. Uh, obviously we're, we're getting things online at, as Millie said on effectively a daily basis perhaps not counting today seeing Millie and I are here while the team are still hard at work um, but uh, yeah there'll be some big uploads coming out later in the week. Um, and part one of the things that this has uh, forced us to do, Millie alluded to, this collection is effectively stretching what we're doing in, in um, other areas. So we've started using uh, the Swanks and Woods Fresh feature, which is a weekly uh, summary of the, the freshly digitised items. Um, and we're getting people checking back uh, weekly and um, uh, sometimes daily, I think, uh, on what we're up, the team are uploading. So. Um, another thing that Swainson uh, Woods Collection has, has made us uh, tackle is start to tackle commenting um, directly, directly on our browser. Uh, as I've mentioned, people are wanting to engage with the collection, uh, identify it, uh, and, and otherwise make comments. So we've added the, the function there together with some, some great work from Vernon, thanks Paul, uh, added the, um, the commenting function there, which basically is very uh, easy to do. It's just a matter of an email address and name and your comment in there. And uh, it's been working uh, amazingly well. We've been getting a, a great uh, range of comments. The flow has been coming on. Uh, everything from, uh, you know, John coming in from the hay paddock there <laughs> for the photo and not too keen, uh, through to simple identifications, uh, through to, yeah, some amazing detail that we'd never find elsewhere. So we've just recently changed, actually, uh, the flow to start with. There was enough for one staff member to keep up. Uh, with that and respond, monitor um, and update the records but we've had to switch to a team approach because we're getting uh, a big response now so um, the team are needing to chip in to make it manageable. Um, of course our friends at Digital New Zealand, I had to, uh, had to mention them, um, they've been a big part of our, of our digital um, strategy over the years and uh, so every, every uh, record with an image attached uh, is harvested now uh, to Digital New Zealand on a weekly basis. So um, yeah, and that's just another great window in to the collection. Um, and obviously we have some uh, tremendous stories of engagement that are coming out. It was difficult to pick um, what to talk about, but uh, really I, I couldn't go past uh, talking about Palmer here briefly as, as an example. She's a, uh, obviously a, a beautiful woman uh, from Australia um, and was lured uh, 
we went to Taranaki, um, by this bloke here, um, Rex, uh, Rex Hopkins, who's a uh, farmer from, uh, from around the coast, and they were married in New Plymouth uh, at St Mary's Church uh, in December 1955. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously a pretty, a pretty amazing story in some ways, or quite typical, but the thing that uh, really brings it alive for us is, is this, uh, this contact. Now, this, you may recognise him from the previous photo. Uh, he's hardly changed a bit, I told him, and he's the kind of guy who laughed when I said that. So. Um, is Rex. So Rex is now uh, over 80, um, and, uh, but an amazing, uh, an amazing character. And he had contacted us previously when he saw, uh, or had been made aware of the photo of, of his wife. And he wrote us a lovely letter, basically, um, quite a touching letter really, about how uh, he was so thrilled to see it, uh, in terms of it, it being shared and treasured, and was obviously incredibly proud of his wife, uh, who has um, contracted Alzheimer's in 2002, and uh, is now in, in hospital. Uh, you know, he, he can't care for her, but he visits her, uh, visits her daily. Um, except, uh, yeah, so, he, he spoke very touchingly when he visited. He came in and, and basically at very short notice dropped in to see the project and we gave him a, a quick tour. And um, I don't know, Millie was talking about problems with dust uh, previously um, with the project and I think there was a lot of dust in the air that day because uh, people were rubbing their eyes quietly uh, as Rex was recounting um, you know, the importance of this, of this photograph to him and uh, you know, showing his appreciation for the project. And um, yeah, I think you know the, the, you could count for a lot of things when you get uh, stories like this sort of starting to emerge. Um, and Rex then, bless him, the next day popped in with a bottle of bubbly. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I'd be, I, this is all about um, not trying to gloss over the problems this this uh, session. So, you know, while we have you know numerous examples like Rex's, um, there's also worth acknowledging that we have problems as well. Um, I guess one that I wanted to raise is, uh, you know, we can feel a bit lost in the ethical woods like Pinocchio here um, because, uh, you know, this collection was never created as obviously a public record. It was a collection of private uh, studio photography. Uh, we're running into, you know, it's quite a contemporary collection. Sure, we start back in the 1920s, but we're running right up into the 90s. Uh, and we have had you know, instances where people have not been as thrilled as others uh, when, when they found themselves or something related online. Uh, we've had instances um, of people whose uh, marriages have, have ended not in the way they would want, uh, and then they see their wedding photos online. Uh, obviously, you know, some people are fine with that, others are not. Um, we've also had issues where people have raised well, hang on, uh, people's past criminal records, uh, you know, who are fetched online as well. Um, so what we, what we need to do, we're basically developing a, a, a I guess case law for want of a better term. We're dealing with these um, on a one-on-one one -on -one sort of a basis where we, uh, we basically consider, consider the case while we're considering the case which somebody puts forward. We take the image down, uh, we look at it carefully, and then uh, you know, we, we explain our reasons. Obviously we're all about access for this collection, but we're, we're operating within uh, you know, constraints and wanting to you know, respect the community. So uh, we really um, look carefully at it and uh, we'll then explain our reasons for the decision and, and either put the image back online or perhaps leave, leave it just as a text record or take it down completely. So um, it's something that I can't give you a fully formed answer on exactly how to deal with every case, but. I'm confident that over, over the time we're going to build up a pretty substantial, um, we want to be consistent and open with people basically, so that's, that's how we confront that. Um, we do have, uh, you know, digital limitations like everyone. Um, uh, this, this bloke I actually used to play rugby with, I was delighted to find, <laughs> delighted to find him in the collection. Uh, he had a very good side set. Um, but Basically, uh, yeah, we, we, we've got a great, um, I think, you know, we're really happy with the progress we've made uh, with our digital presence over the years. Um, and, and, you know, together with, with working with Vernon and Digital New Zealand, it's been great. But I'm, I'm conscious that there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, our search function could be improved. Uh, you know, our image size, our flexibility. There are a lot of things, um, you know, which we, we're going to continue to work on. 
Um, possibilities for the collection, looking to the future, are pretty limitless, to be honest. Uh, you know, we could do things like letting, letting the artists in. Um, and we're going to continue a huge focus for us will be that uh, bridge building to the community. So, uh, but that's got to happen in various ways and um, can never stop really for us. So, um, you know, I'm really interested uh, seeing um, Chris's presentation um, before lunch in terms of the names and, uh, and matching um, da other data, data sets because we're going to have a huge data set here uh, and we'll be really interested to see those sort of possibilities, what we can do. Um, but really, like this, uh, this Beal rabbit here, uh, you know, you could never predict that this sort of image would be in the collection, <laughs> and here it is. So, just like a big fluffy rabbit uh, on top of a polished pedestal, uh, we don't really know what the future holds for this collection, and, and or what really lies underneath that we haven't discovered. Um, so, you know, I'm really looking forward to uh, to, to carrying on and with an open mind, to be honest. So, yeah, that's wraps it up from us. Uh, we've got a huge amount of work ahead of us, I should say. I don't know if we actually mentioned, but we've, since the digitisation project was underway, uh, we've got in excess of 25,000 um, negatives digitised. Um, but as Millie alluded to as well, we're just in this phase of getting colour off, off the ground, which is going to be a whole other set of challenges. And, you know, we've done a lot of the easier um, parts of the collection perhaps first, so I wouldn't, you know, it would be great to keep that up, but I can't imagine that pace will continue. But yeah, so I'm happy to take questions for, to either myself or Millie if we've got some time. I'm not sure how we're placed. A couple of minutes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Um, so, a couple of so around copyright then, I guess the photographer has kept the copyright of all of the images, so you have the copyright, mm -hmm. you have the rights to all yeah, well, I, I guess, I guess, uh, yeah, obviously a vexed issue, like for uh, for everyone. Um, I don't know if there's really a, a blanket answer uh, in terms of when we get requests, in terms of um, you know taking a, taking an image down, for example. If somebody is in that image, um, then that would be a, a key a key thing for us. Yeah. And are you asserting copyright over the digital um, the scans that you're doing? You're going to publish those under like an incredible. Uh, well, at the moment, it's similar, I think, in a way to um, where, where Nelson's at. Uh, we do, like, we're processing, um, well, you know, we'll, we'll provide images. Uh, people can, anything that's online there, that just as so long as they provide a link to it, we'll let them use it. Uh, in terms of, we'll be processing images through the image service as well, which we, we have for the high-res uh, things. Um, I guess, yeah, we haven't, we've looked at Creative Commons, but um, we haven't looked at, you know, uh, instituting it yet. Um, yeah. I mean, Judy would sign the collection over to us. She signed the copyright as well. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I guess, I guess, what we want to do is, is you know, navigate the somewhat murky water in the best way we can. Uh, but yeah, that was an important precondition, wasn't it, before we uh, would take the collection? Yeah. Um, Millie, you mentioned that the background of five thousand more things could cause problems. You got to speak with us, Millie. Do you get, how do you get around that? Do you have a, a sampling thing just to check the quality of your... Well, we do now. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think we needed it, but then we found out via that incident that we did. <laughs> so now we go forward and check. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I better look at this. So thank you very much, Andrew and Millie.